सर वी आर लाइव नाउ राइट एम आई विजिबल नो यस सर यस सर ओके माई स्लाइड इज विजिबल Uh, my slide is visible and i am audible yeah audible slide you are not shared the screen yet. okay okay something will no sir you are not shared you have to share then it will become okay is that okay yes yes sir no again something wrong now i am okay so i am audible also yes sir you are audible yes, sir yes sir okay so friends good evening uh i first of all take this opportunity to welcome all the office bearers of indian orthopedic association and all the faculty members friends it's a great delight when you organize a webinar and the head of the family the president dr atul srivastav is present along with president elect dr <laughs> ram chadha and our secretary general a uh, not secretary but secretary general dr navin thakkar and we have association of our own very pre, uh, our very own president of indian orthopedic rheumatology association dr santanu lahkar friends the topic we are going to discuss is the in this first webinar is biologics in orthopedic rheumatology and i will now request dr atul srivastava president ioa to give his inaugural address namaskar and good evening to all navin can you mute yourself navin can you mute yourself thank you so i wish you all a very happy safe prosperous successful and for the iwa a harmonious 2023 it is really heartening to see that the sub committee of the indian orthopedic association on rheumatology is organizing this webinar today and it says the first webinar that itself proves that it is going to be continuing with many more webinar webinars under of course the patronage of our own dr s h hasar who has put in so much of effort along with his committee members dr ranjit singh dr chinmoy and dr sharat agarwal a few days back we had a webinar on introduction to orthobiologics on the 7th and here we are on the 12th on being a bit more specific so this is orthobiologics in rheumatology in very interesting topics eminent speakers and i am sure all of us are going to gain a lot at the end of the webinar thank you sir thank you for the invite thank you thank you very much for all the encouragement that we have been receiving from all over indian orthopedic association beginning from previous so many years now is the turn of our president elect dr ram chandha to say his inaugural words good evening everybody uh, professor s s jha thank you very much for the invitation i welcome each one of you attending this very interesting first webinar by the indian orthopedic rheumatology association we have uh, the president of the ioa our own dr atul srivastav who said strong bone stronger nation and we have our secretary general dr navin thakkar who 
represents the three of us who are a part and parcel of the IOA and have been with you and would be for the next year. We also welcome the president of the IORA, Dr. Santanu Lakar, with whom I have a very old association right from the days when we were spine surgeons together in the past. And it's been a pleasure to have you, sir. We have eminent speakers. Uh, we have Dr. Ranjit Singh, we have Dr. S.S. Amarnath, we have Dr. Chinmoy Das, we have Dr. Sharad Akrawal, we have Dr. Dhanasekara, Dr. Jairaman, each one of them, along with Professor Ravi Gupta, who's going to enlighten us on something that we know very little about. Biologics is something where either we refer the patient to the rheumatologist or we say, ke, nahi, nahi, ye, isse kuch farak nahi padta. But gentlemen, and I have been actually educated by Dr. S.S. S. Jha, that this is something which is an integral part of our contribution to rheumatology. And we need to know more about it and use it in our practice on a regular basis. Besides just writing one drug, we should know what is to be used, when it is to be used, and how efficacious it is. Hence, this particular meeting today to educate ourselves with our colleagues who are actually using it and are using it regularly. Thank you very much, each one of you, the attendees and the faculty for being here to tell us something that we know very little about, but want to know more. Thank you all. Welcome to this excellent webinar. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Ram. And now it is the turn of beaming Dr. Naveen, who, who has always been a very good uh, uh, promoter of whatever we have been doing and supports this Indian Orthopedic Rheumatology Association. Your opening remarks, Navi. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the invitation and your remarks for us. <laughs> and uh, this committee is working very hard since last two years, we are seeing. And all the webinars are very, very informative and very, very much we are getting feedbacks, learning each something new. Ultimately, it is helping our patients. So, I will not waste much time, but let the <laughs> academics flow so that uh, we can get more and more knowledge out of all the faculty. And we are thankful to all the faculty on behalf of the Indian Orthopedic Association. And we welcome all the delegates. And these are getting recorded in the IOTV. And you will be able to see everything on IO website now, all the education material. Everything will be available on I, uh, our uh, IO TV and IO website. So please visit IO website and get the, all the webinars and information, previous webinars and continuous knowledge is going through all the videos, surgical procedures and everything. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. And now <laughs> it is the turn of Guru of Gurus. Dr. Santanu Lahkar, who is incidentally the president of Indian Orthopedic Association uh, also. Indian Orthopedic Rheumatology Association. So good evening to all and best wishes for our new year 2023. <clears throat> Respected President IOA Dr. Uttur Sivastav Sal, President elect Dr. Ram Sattha, Secretary General, our Dr. Nobin Thakkar, who is always an inspiration for all of us. Our most respected, our teacher, Dr. S.S. Sarsal, and Dr. Manish Khanna in his absence, all the faculty members and participants. As already mentioned, keeping in mind of IOA President team, uh, 2023 Strong Bones and Strong Nation, Today, we are going to start our first webinar, Biologics in Orthopedic Rheumatology. And I convey my best wishes for the beginning of our journey. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Santanu. Well, friends, Yes, hello. Am I audible? Sir. Yes. So, friends, 
Today's topic, Biologic in Orthopedic Rheumatology. It, this subject has been kept as the topic of first webinar to allay the fears of our orthopedic brothers that we as orthopedic surgeons should not write or are not permitted to write biologics. This is a wrong notion. So we have every right to prescribe, but then we should understand the modalities before prescribing it. Well, whatever treatment is feasible for rheumatic diseases, they are basically called as disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. And these drugs can be classified into conventional synthetic DMARDs, targeted synthetic DMARDs, and biologic DMARDs. So biologics are also DMARDs. Normally, what we understand that no, only sulfur salazine, methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, they are DMARDs. No, they are conventional synthetic ones including leflunomide and the small molecules like tofacitinib, so much in use now, baricitinib, they are targeted synthetic. And the biologics are also known as BDMARD, out of which we have got anti-TNF and so many others that we are going to discuss. Now, if the originator has uh, developed a DM, biological DMARD, this is known as BODMARD, and biosimilars are known as biosimilar DMARD. Similarly, talking about targeted synthetic, these small molecules, which are also known as jack inhibitors, you can see the figure of two heads in one statue. This is God Janus. And this God Janus has two faces. One looks into the past and one looks into the future. Now, chemically, this is more related to traditional methotrexate than to biological DMARD. Friends, it was in an attempt to develop a oral biologic that this development took place. So, a small molecule are oral drugs which are known as targeted synthetic DMARDs, they work like biologics, but structurally or chemically, they are more related to traditional methotrexate. Now, onset of response occurs within two weeks. Efficacy is maintained up to five years. It targets multiple cytokines and it inhibits intracellular signaling pathways. I must tell you here itself, that this is the only uh, targeted synthetic DMRD which works inside the cell. All the biologics that we are going to discuss, they work in extracellular space. So here it transmits signal from surface receptor to the nucleus, whereas all the biologics will only work on the surface receptors. Without going into more details, now it is the turn of the expert of IOA Rheumatology Subcommittee 2023 and Professor Ranjit Singh, who is professor in the Department of Orthopedics in Patna Medical College, will speak about biologics, a preview. Dr. Ranjit. Thank I you, stop, sir. I stop sharing and you load your presentation. Oh, so <clears throat> may I start, sir? Yes. With your permission, of course. <clears throat> sure. So uh, I'm giving an introductory, uh, I mean, a bit of about biologics. So this is about me, nothing very special. So medicine has come a long way in very short time. New and interesting drugs make a big difference in our everyday lives. And the most exciting of these new drugs are the biologics. These drugs 
offer better treatment options. They are targeted, personalized, and patients are, they are good for the patient like never before. But what are these biologics? They are manufactured in, extracted from, or semi-synthesized from biological sources or <clears throat> living sources like human, animal, plants, fungi, microbials, etc. There are a wide range of products, right from vaccines, blood to recombinant therapeutic proteins and living med medicines used in cell therapy. But what are they? To define them, biologics can be composed of sugars, proteins, or nucleic acids, or combination of these substances, or maybe a living entity such as cells and tissues. Some regular agencies use the term biological medicinal products for them to differentiate them uh, from blood and vaccine, etc. These medications are given with little either injected under skin or infused in a vein. There are four major categories of biologicals TNF alpha inhibitors, interleukin inhibitors, T cell inhibitors like Avatacept, B cell inhibitors like Lutuximab. Etc. So they are many are formed by the recombinant DNA. What is this recombinant DNA? Formed artificially by combining constituents from different organisms. Also sometimes referred to as chimera. This RDNA generally means taking a part of one DNA and combining it with another strand of DNA, thus the name recombinant. And this way, scientists are able to create a new strand of DNA. This is the way they are in laboratory, this recombinant DNA is formed. Uh, probably it won't uh, uh, much interest to orthopedic surgeon, but just for the sake of knowing a little bit. So what this RDNA does, so many substances are produced by this recombinant DNA. Some senses that are identical to body's own key signaling proteins like erythropoietin, growth hormones, biosynthetic human insulin, or its analog or teriparatide. Then mono, drug of our interest, monoclonal antibody. These are similar to the antibodies that the human immune system uses to fight bacteria and viruses, but they are custom made. And then the finally, receptor constructs. Here, the naturally occurring receptors are joined with the immunoglobin and they intercept the TNF alpha and don't let them join with the TNF receptor. So that's why preventing the, this uh, cascade of events, inflammatory events. Then there are two types of antibodies, moni, polyclonal and monoclonal. Polyclonal antibody, antibodies are preparations from immunized animals and it consists of complex mixture of different antibodies produced by many different B cell clones. While monoclonals are monoclonal antibody are homogeneous antibody preparations produced in laboratory consist of a single type of antigen binding site produced by a single beta cell clone. They are different types of monoclonal antibodies depending upon what is the percentage of human or animal source in it. This 100% mouse is mouse map, 33% one third is chimeric map, five to 10% humanized map. And if it is 100%, then it's fully human. This has got a minimal immunogenicity. It has got a possibility of multiple treatments and serum half-life is more. The problem with these maps are the nomenclature. They are difficult to pronounce, but how the name is given. Take an example. The common map stain, less as a suffix, denotes a monoclonal antibody. Typically, a monoclonal antibody name has four segments and five syllables. Segment one is a prefix and is random, under the control of drug dealer. Segment two, denote the target or disease. Uh, something, a vowel may be added 
for the add of pronunciation, like, and that is B for here, B is for bacteria, F for fungi, and T for tumor. Segment three indicates the source of antibody, U for human, A for rat, and XI for chimeric. And finally, the suffix map to denote this is monoclonal antibody. And now let us try it on denotoxy map. Denu is the distinct distinctive prefix. Tu is T for tumor, and U is added for ease of pronunciation. Xi means the antibody is chimeric, and MAP denotes the class of drug monoclonal antibody, and that is the name is denutoxy MAP. Then other uh, thing that is very important is fusion protein that is produced by again RDNA. Fusion proteins are chimeric proteins and created through the joining of two or more genes that originally coded for separate proteins. A fusion protein combines the attributes of more than one protein in a way that enhances its ability to treat disease. Etanercept is a fusion protein produced by RDNA. Then there are various names uh, in market for biology. They say this is original, this is biosimilar. What are they? Originated biologic or reference product is the initial biological product submitted to the FDA for approval and not related to any other biological product. This is the product a biosimilar that is compared with, also used for determining interchangeability of biological products. While biosimilars are products shown to be highly similar to the reference product, no clinically meaningful difference between the biological product, along with no difference in safety, purity, and potency. While the interchangeable products is a biological product that has been approved for substitution for another biological product without the intervention of the prescriber of the original products. They, they call it sometimes fingerprint biology. Uh, it's just like you look at this Pinot Noir. This is a grape wine produced by this, uh, this grape produced in France and California. A wine produced by these two, gra uh, same grape cultivated at two places. The wine produced is almost similar, but not identical. That is the story for biosimilar and original. Why is there growing interest in biosimilars? It is estimated that by 2022, 1 trillion on medicine will be sent in all these countries. 17% of drug spent is allocated to biologics. Biologic sales are growing at the rate of 14% while normal other drugs are at 4%. Biologics represent approximately 1% of claims. Patent expiry could offer opportunities for drug spent savings because the prices are to come down. So what are the expectations of a clinician as our <clears throat> president told? It should efficacy. It should be proved in a planned clinical trial. In clean, uh, and in clinic efficacy, and also it, said it should be interchangeable. Safety, similar adverse events profile and low immunology, immunogenicity as the original product. And of course, finally, affordability of, for the patients. Conclusion, biologics shall become an important part of future healthcare landscape. With patent expiration of innovator products, the biosimilars will increasingly become available. Physicians must consider the following points for proper prescription and safety of the pa patients. Purity, efficacy, safety, immunogenicity, and of course, very important cost of therapy. Thank you, <clears throat> sir. And I hand over to- Thank you Kiamis. very much. Uh, you have to stop sharing. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, Dr. Ranjit, I must congratulate you for you have with lot of clarity explained even why and how the nomenclature has to be 
like that. So each word of the nomenclature you have clarified. Uh, very uh, nice. Uh, uh, Professor Jha. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, you have joined and I know uh, you, are, you are in a running train. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. So right. there are issues, yeah. So, uh, uh, all. so Dr. Ranjit, and you have also talked about biologics and biosimilars, mm -hmm. and you have very aptly discussed it with the grape product produced mm -hmm. at two different places, and one is a biologic and the other mm -hmm. will behave like a biosimilar. So you have discussed about all the cytokine targeted therapies, which are TNF alpha inhibitors, alpha inhibitor biosimilars, then IL-1 inhibitor, IL-6 inhibitor, IL anti-IL-12 or IL-23, the names I will say, because whenever you hear these names, they will look familiar to you. Uste Kinu map. Anti-IL-17A is secukinumab and is very much in use and is available in India. The other one is exekizumab. Anti-IL-17 receptor is brodalumab. Anti-IL-23 is guselkumab. Now, the two therapies you have also named, they are B-cell targeted therapies. The rituximab, which is so commonly used by us, they are anti-CD20 and B-cell growth factor inhibitor, that is belimubab. The T-cell targeted therapy, which is anti-CD80 or 86, which goes by the name of abatacept. Friends, this is biologic part one seminar the next webinar is going to be biologic part two, where we will be including small molecules. We will be including the B cell and T cell inhibitors as well. Well, management of rheumatological conditions are, as I have already said, that the systemic anti rheumatic drugs are to be used, which are known as disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Now, the factors which determine the choice of DMARD therapy, which perhaps Dr. Manish Khanna also wanted you to know, was there are factors in the disease and factors in the patient. So, the disease factors are severity of disease, duration of illness, bad prognostic factor, presence of deformities. Patient factors are comorbidities, infection, age, compliance, affordability, safety, and friends, most important of this all, many of our patients are young. They are going to be parents. So their fertility plans have to be taken into consideration. This becomes so very important. Well, unfortunately, Manish is not here, but we will be discussing the use of biologic in early rheumatoid arthritis. I will be dealing with it myself in my presentation. Well, spondyloarthropathy and the intestinal and hepatobiliary disease. Friends, now this hypothesis is very important which is not only a hypothesis, now it is almost proved to the extent that bowel is a source which also affects the joints or even the skin. So as far as the hepatobiliary disease is concerned, the last point number four, it is autoimmune hepatitis known as AH which represents polyarthritis and positive ANA. They can mimic even systemic lupus erythematosus. Well, 25% of patients are associated with inflammatory bowel disease, most commonly in those with extensive colonic involvement. So the colon is the seat of involvement 
of IBD constitutes 25%. Now, even otherwise, consider a bowel disease in any patient with an intermittent inflammatory arthritis, regardless of presence or, presence or absence of gastrointestinal symptoms. Number three, episodes of peripheral spondyloarthropathy may or may not coincide with flares of bowel disease, while axial SPA occurs independent of bowel disease activity. Well, bowel disease associated with inflammatory arthritis, all of us are aware that IBD, interstitial bowel disease, is Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So ulcerative colitis is IBD associated with spondyloarthropathy, all these two. Microscopic colitis, which is also goes by the name of lymphocytic colitis and collagenous colitis. Then infectious gastroenteritis, Whipple's disease, where also the GIT involvement is associated with peripheral joint arthritis, the celiac disease, bowel-associated dermatosis arthritis syndrome are various areas where enteropathic etiology has to be there. Now, with this background, I would request Dr. P. Dhanshekhara Raja from Coimtur to talk about why gut involvement influences rheumatology management. I stop share, Dr. Raja. Thank you, Professor Jha. Uh, good evening, all faculty and uh, viewers. I'm going to talk about uh, the gut involvement and the uh, role of uh, gut involvement in pathogenesis and of the rheumatoid uh, arthritis. So it involves uh, these topic uh, subheadings. Uh, what you need to know about human microbiome. What is dysbiosis? and the role of gut in RA pathogenesis and therapeutic importance of uh, this uh, issue. So first of all, we need to know that human uh, microbi microbial ecosystem is quite vast and more than uh, 1,000 trillion bacteria are present in the distal gut. Uh, the micro microbes are present in the skin, lungs, oral cavity, perineum, in multiple places and they play an important role in uh, uh, disease uh, evolution. So if we look at the various uh, disease uh, uh, in um, humans, uh, there is a large role played by the microbiome, including, including autism spectrum disorder, hypertension, kidney stone formation, insulin resistance, asthma and allergy, metabolic syndrome and obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, colorectal cancer, and the list is uh, never ending. So the genetic predisposition and environmental factors, including uh, diet, has been shown to trigger rheumatoid arthritis. And dysbiosis plays an important role. And bacterial lineages, in the, which causes change in the alteration in the uh, microbiota in the gut, leads to host uh, immune profile changes and onset of rheumatoid arthritis. So the alteration of gut microbiota has been proved beyond doubt that there is change in the microbiome in the gut, which leads to triggering of the systemic immunity and onset of the rheumatoid arthritis. And the common soil is replaced by different strains of uh, bacteria, which directly invade the immune system. And alteration of immune system leads to uh, activation of rheumatoid arthritis. So how do we know this? They have this SKG mice which develops the arthritis when they are subjected to a specific type of immune challenge, they develop spontaneous arthritis. And they are used to investigate uh, the role of uh, cytokines and all these uh, uh, interleukins, uh, and they can create the uh, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis in the lab. So when you expose these microorganisms, uh, these mice to specific uh, uh, gut uh, bacteria or these uh, T helper cell uh, with, uh, with immune activation, they develop arthritis. And these have been used to uh, investigate the role of uh, gut in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So there are three different phenomena by which the gut can trigger and activate the pathology. First is release of pro-inflammatory metabolites like interleukin-12, 23, 
second is impairment of intestinal mucosal barrier which leads to uh, auto auto immunity and direct invasion of the bacteria and molecular mimicry of auto antigens the antigen presenting presenting cells in the gut are exposed to this uh, bacteria and they are able to trigger the auto immunity so these three phenomenon can be seen in this uh, picture so the gut homeostasis is lost the common cell is replaced by some pathological strains and they weaken the tight junction in the gut leads to inflammation in the uh, mucosa and allows the bacteria to enter the uh, mucosa and they stimulate the antigen presenting cells which leads to activation of autoimmunity and the autoimmunity is again reflected in the joints leads to destruction of the joint cartilage and other uh, interleukin release leads to further damage they also mimic the antigen presenting uh, rheumatoid factor cells so you can be seen also in periodontal disease and lung uh, involvement uh, we can we see a lot of patients with uh, reactive arthritis having autoimmunity and they have reactive arthritis this is a similar mechanism periodontal infection gut infection lung infection can uh, cause reactive arthritis so these are different uh, studies which have shown that the oral bacteria uh hack can affect uh the immune mechanism and leads to uh, settlement of the uh macrophages which will again lead to uh, immune activation so if you look at specifically what happens in early rheumatoid arthritis there are some species of bacteria which is uh, increase in number and some beneficial bacteria reduce in number so Pro provotella coprey lactobacillus species are increased and bacterioids and bifidobacterium and eubacterium rectale all reduced so these are uh, protective uh, bacteria this absence of this leads to uh, stimulation of the activation of the rheumatoid arthritis in active rheumatoid arthritis lactobacillus salivarius and colony cella all these species is increased so these invade the uh, mucosa activate the immune mechanism this autoimmunity leads to <clears throat> joint destruction and also they release cytokines from the gut mucosa like interleukin 1 6 and 17 which again affect the joint as per se so if you see bacteria bacteria is uniform is very important for the stability of dermatin sulfate once this bacteria is reduced this leads to uh, disintegration of the dermatin sulfate and chondroitin sulfate which is part of the cartilage again if there is increase in e coli that leads to activation of certain amino acids like l arginine and ascorbate which leads to from uh, bone loss and decrease uh, bone mineral uh, density periarticular osteolysis so again dysbiosis with uh, these bacteria can directly inhibit the osteoclast and cause bone resorption so how do we modulate this uh, uh, gut induced uh, problems there are two ways one is use of oral probiotics second is fecal floral fecal flora transplantation so again we can see there is roll up some uh, biologics what we use like methotrexate dmrds again they have a positive reinforcement on the gut so when we take this uh, methotrexate sulfa salicin hydrochlor hydroxychloroquine they restore the normal gut uh, bacteria and lead, leads to positive response so they work symbiotically creating a good therapeutic response if you look at uh, probiotics first studies have shown that in rat model uh, use of uh, lactobacillus cc and acidophilus reduce the arthritic inflammation and pannus formation and cartilage destruction so it has been shown in the multiple rat studies but some species like lactobacillus ruteri and ramanus uh, actually do not cause this effect so we need to be very specific about the uh, probiotic what we are using so these are in animal studies but more human trials has to be done and specific species has to be used to have the desirable effect second fecal microbiota transplantation in resistant there are case reports there where there is refractory ra uh, fecal microbiota transplantation from healthy individual has reduced the effect of the disease and caused remission and there are few case reports but further uh, studies has to come but this is on potential area of future research second is indirect regulation of gut microbiota so when you start using methotrexate there is remodeling of the gut microbiota so in turn it increase the bioavailability of methotrexate so they work symbiotically 
the methotrexate restores the normal gut uh, common salts and it increases the absorption of methotrexate and bioavailability of these drugs and partially restore the uh, gut microbiome. Sulfur salicin again has been shown to substantially uh, reduce the fecal counts of Clostridium perfringens and E. coli. Again, if you use uh, uh, sulfur salicin in uh, patients, the total aerobic bacteria, bacteroids, all these uh, counts are uh, increased. When you use etanacept, there is specific increase in Clostridaceae species. But hydroxychloroquine has increased the total uh, intestinal bacterial richness and diversity. So there are different uh, therapeutic uh, drugs have different effects. Coming to dietary fiber, dietary fiber reduces the gut leakage. Drugs like uh, I mean uh, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids restores the intestinal milieu. And high salt diet is uh, increases the inflammation and they are poor pro-inflammatory. So diet should be uh, less in carbohydrate and a low salt diet is better. Diet rich in omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids are beneficial. So typically a Mediterranean diet is very beneficial. They have short chain fatty acids and especially the presence of butyrate is very beneficial. So diet, Mediterranean diet is typically rich in fruits, vegetables and um, with moderate consumption of fit and low consumption of uh, red meat is beneficial. A study has shown that DAA score has improved after this uh, diet uh, when you compare to control group. Depletion of amino acids like glutamine and tryptophan or depletion of zinc resulted in uh, increased gut permeability. Vitamin D and polyphenols improved the expression of tight junction. They are all beneficial. See, all these are part of the Mediterranean diet. A Western diet which is rich in fatty acids and alcohol has a negative influence on the uh, bacterial flora. So when you combine these uh, approaches, there is a lot of therapeutic benefit. It has been shown that blockage of zonulin with larazotide, which is a, a drug uh, which uh, prevents the onset of arthritis in mouse models. So this can be a future uh, uh, a therapeutic product for uh, gut dysbiosis. So concluding, gut microbiome dysregulation is associated with uh, dysregulated immune tolerance and RA development. Change in the gut microbiota can precede the onset of rheumatoid arthritis and are related to dif different stage activities. Analysis of gut microbiota composition can also predict susceptibility and has become a useful method to predict the control of rheumatoid arthritis incidence. And there's mounting evidence that targeted modulation of gut microbiome can alleviate rheumatoid symptoms and personalized treatment approach with the patient-specific microbiome profile can increase drug efficiency, lower toxicity and improve outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. So, uh, Dr. Raja, you have not only discussed about the detailed pathogenesis of gut involvement along with its uh, osteoarticular involvement. The, the dysbiosis being the basic pathology. Uh, you have also discussed about the various diets that could be of help and uh, that will be a great help to all of us. Now, the latest management of dysbiosis has been fecal microtransplantation and this is an area in which a lot of research is going on. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, sir. <clears throat> now is the turn of methotrexate man. Uh, definitely, Dr. Raja has touched upon some aspects of methotrexate, but still a lot has to be there about why add methotrexate with biologics. Professor Chinmay Das from this school. Sorry, I will stop sharing. Yes, sir. Please. Right. Sir, is it visible? And I'm, yes, am yes, I audible, you are sir? audible and visible. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a very good webinar. Uh, 
from the starting as you were leaving the IA orthopedic uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, subcommittee. So I knew it is going to be a vibrant one this year. So thank you for this opportunity giving to me, sir. So I will just say about methotrexate, but why we should add methotrexate with the biologics? So just the uh, Going by the, our past speakers, methotrexate is nowadays, it is considered as the anchor drug of rheumatoid arthritis. It was developed in the 1940s as folic acid antagonist. So basically what it does is it calms your immune system, stops the cells the, from growing, all the T cells, B cells, and it is mainly excreted by the kidneys, by glomerular filtration and tubular uh, secretion. And it is metabolized in the liver and 10% of the drug is excreted in the bile. But it has got side effects and mainly the side effects are gastrointestinal, around 20 to 65%, of which nausea is around 92% and vomiting around 31%. Abdominal cramps, black terry stool, blood in urine and stool, increased heart rate, itching, rashes, reddening of the skin, hair loss, around 3%, sores in the mouth and lips. Although these, these side effects, they are present with most of the uh, conventional bi biologics, uh, conventional DMARDs, or your uh, other demands, so they are targeted demands, also has got these yeah, um, side effects. But it is a very important methotrexate because a patient can stay on methotrexate for around 20 years. That's a very big advantage for uh, people who are treating rheumatoid arthritis. And the success rate is around 65 to 95%. This is how it acts. It actually uh, uh, inhibits your know, dihydrofolate reductase, thereby reducing the uh, folic acid, means uh, stopping the folic acid metabolism. And the dihydrofolate cannot be converted to tetrahydrofolate, which is an active form of folic acid, thereby it uh, decreases the DNA metabolism, decreases the pyrimidine and purine synthesis. It also acts, inhibits an uh, enzyme called ACAR transformulase. This is 5 amino imidazole carboxamide, 4 carboxamide radionucleotide transformulase, whereby it increases the ACAR extracellularly and which in turn increases the adenosine. This is a pathway, adenosine signaling pathway which has come in focus and uh, methotrexate, the mainly the function, the action of methotrexate is by this adenosine signaling pathway, whereby there is downregulation of your pro-inflammatory cytokines, inhibition of apoptosis, as well as inhibition of your neutrophil and lymphocyte chemotaxis. So why methotrexate? See, actually there are no strict guidelines that which conventional synthetic DMARD to start first. But methotrexate of all the conventional DMARDs, it has got a rapid action, rapid onset of action and patient tolerance, cost consideration and ease of once weekly administration of methotrexate is the DMARD choice. It is widely prescribed in the world, and when used more than one year, it has been found in several studies that it decreases the mortality by around 70%. So methotrexate, the drug is given once weekly. Convenience is it can be taken orally. Around 7.5 to up to 25 to 30 milligram you can give once weekly. It is taken orally, but you can go with subcutaneous injections or intramuscular injections. 
it has got side effects, uh, mainly GI side effects and hepatotoxicity. But monitoring is very important where you go for blood counts and LFT every six to eight weeks, chest X-rays annually, urea creatinine for renal function. As I have already said that uh, it is excreted by kidneys and it can accumulate there. So urea and creatinine three monthly you can go for and sometimes liver biopsy because one of the uh, major complication of methotrexate, long-term methotrexate use is your cirrhosis of liver. This is how it works. So with adenosine receptor pin present in the, uh, in the cell wall, it goes intracellularly, it uh, inhibits your ACAR transformylase enzyme, which inhibits your ACAR for ACAR uh, conversion to formal acar and also has got an inhibitory effect on adenosine deaminase where I, whereby it increases the adenosine and this adenosine goes extracellularly and uh, this adenosine is not uh, converted to inosine. These are various receptors present in uh, the cell membrane uh, they are classified as A1, A2A, A2B, and A2, A3. And these have got specific, specific actions, these uh, receptor molecules, because uh, mainly the A1 and A2A, uh, these are very uh, metotrixate friendly, and uh, they help in your, they uh, act via the adenosine signaling pathway, and they they reduce the adhesion the, of your neutrophil and macrophages, as well as the A2A, it reduces your inhibition of super. There is increase of, this is another theory that uh, superoxide anion production, which also uh, goes for apoptosis of the cells. There is a, a conversion of macrophages, which are, M1, the macrophages, they are divided into M1 and M2. So the transition from M1 to M2 is reduced. This uh, M2 is your inflammatory type of macrophages. Then it inhibits the T cells, inhibits B cells, and increase the production of collagen 1 and 3. So should conventional DMRDs used singly or in combination. See, combination therapy has got an inherent appeal for especially for us orthopedic surgeons and combination DMARs is specifically, especially effective if they include methotrexate as an anchor drug. Combination methotrexate with leflunomide are there acting synergistically since their mode of action is different. And these are the studies which support it, but methotrexate is not to be taken with trimethoprim and adalimab, with adalimab, it increases life-threatening infection. So we have to be careful using this drug with other biologic demands. So men, when methotrexate fails, if it is failing, then what, we, what are the options? We have got around four options. We can switch to subcutaneous route or add conventional DMARs, corticosteroids, hydroxychloroquine, leflunomide, or sulfasalazine with it, or add a biologic agent or switch to tofacitinib. That's a JAK inhibitor, as Sir has already said in his uh, introductory remarks. Regarding biologics, I will not say more because this is not my subject. It has already been taken by Professor Ranjit Singh and Sar also in the introductory remark, but they also inhibit the T cells, B cells, as well as the macrophages. So methotrexate with biologics, it has got some mechanistic advantages. So it increases the effectiveness of biologics 
it reduces antigenicity against the anti drug antibodies then prolongs the time you can stay on biologics and reduces clearance of biologic agents that is longer persistence of the treatment these are the studies which support this uh, theory recently in the 22 2022 we have got euler guidelines these guidelines come up every 3 years and they have clearly said that you can add methotrexate with uh, if it is not responding after 3 months uh, the biomarkers poor prognostic factors are present then you can directly go and add it with the jack inhibitors thank you sir Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chinmay. Yes, uh, all right. So you have already discussed about the monitoring is very important, and you have told us in greater detail about the adenosine cycle through which it finally works. Uh, well, as far as its use with adalimumab is concerned, there has to be a word of caution as told by you. But then the it is not that it is never to be used with adalimumab. Yes. Rather, people advocating use of adalimumab, they say that you must use it then the adalimumab is more effective. If you do not use it, maybe the dose of adalimumab from bi-weekly, it may have to be once weekly. So the dose may need to be uh, increased. So only thing, infection is a definite complication of not only use of these two combination, it is true for all the combination or maybe even in cases of monotherapy. So we have to be alert on that count. Now, this definitely is a gold standard drug and you have mentioned that various uh, guidelines also mention use, but the most important thing you have said that anti-drug antibody formation does not take place if it is added with a biologic. This yes. is the most important aspect. And uh, one thing, uh, in monitoring, you have said the chest x-ray and maybe at a later date, liver biopsy is important. The most common complication with methotrexate that can affect the lungs is interstitial lungs disease. Yes. So to prevent this complication, it should be added on the same day with little steroid. So a steroid weekly along with this should be advocated to prevent the development of interstitial lung disease. Now regarding use of simultaneous folic acid is an area, controversial area. People say that folic acid should be given, supplemented rather, should be supplemented and it should not be given on the day that methotrexate is being given. Now, all the points are debatable. Now, people say no harm, give it. Now, people say uh, uh, you may use it daily. Some people say use it only twice daily. But the most accepted path uh, will be that use them not on the day that you are using them and minimum use twice or thrice a week. You, you want to make some comment? Yes, sir. So regarding this folic acid, and it is debatable as you have already said, sir. See, folic acid, it's a synthetic vitamin B9. The, the natural uh, product is your folinic acid, sir. So uh, it has been seen that folic acid, the, no doubt methotrexate is a drug which is uh, discovered or invented against as a folic acid antagonist. But it has found, it, has, it is uh, uh, also relevant in case of rheumatoid arthritis 
it has been found in the late uh, 1980s that it acts against rheumatoid arthritis also. But this folic acid, actually just 5 milligram, 1 to 5 milligram of folic acid is given. And that is not able to reverse the changes of methotrexate. That's why people say nowadays that it can be given. But this folinic acid, the naturally occurring uh, benign vitamin, uh, so it should not, it means in high doses, it reverses or stops the action of methotrexate. That's why folinic acid, it can be used in uh, from 15 milligram to around 150 milligram till your methotrexate level comes down below 0.5 uh, micrograms of in uh, per deciliter of blood. So, uh, but folinic acid has got the capacity to reverse the actions of methotrexate. But folic acid as such, it doesn't have that capacity in the normal dose, whatever we give uh, five milligram daily, sir. Right. So, uh, it is our universal opinion that folic acid should be given. Yes, sir. Like it can be given. Dose of 5 milligram. Preferably, do not use it on the day that you have given methotrexate to be more safe. Yes, sir. Because uh, uh, methotrexate also, the peak plasma level, it uh, reaches at around 1 to 2 hours just after the medication, oral medication. And uh, it remains in circulation only for 24 hours. So by that time, it uh, goes down from the circulation intracellularly. Right. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank now, uh, Dr. Raza has already spoken about IL-1, IL-12, IL-23, TH-17. So all these cytokines and TNF-alpha we have been discussing from the first topic. So what are these cytokines and what cytokine inhibitors do? We have Dr. A. A. Razamani who has primary interest into spinal surgery, but it is our affection that we always pester him to be here and he is there. So he will primarily speak on all the cytokine inhibitors, most of them. And in the end, he will also show some of his spinal surgery cases. Dr. Rajamani, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, I will stop there. Right. Yes, you are there now. My screen is shared. Yes. Uh, Rajavani, welcome. Yeah, welcome, 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 welcome. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Dilip, you are, yeah, you yeah, are yeah, audible. Yeah, I know, audible. I know, I know. I know. I, yeah. yeah, yeah. Good evening to all and uh, Jasar. And my talk is mainly on uh, cytokine inhibitors. And my talk three phases. What is cytokine, types of cytokines, pathology, role of cytokines, cytokine inhibitors, and role of spine surgery? <clears throat> Rajamani, your slides are not shown. Pardon? Your slides are not visible. Uh, you share the screen first. Share, <clears throat> share the screen first. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Now yes. better. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. This I, I just go to uh, this uh, uh, slide. So uh, on the top, there, there is animation and then slide. So on the top, red, red, top, red. No, go on the top, red. No, you were all right. Again, share the screen. Now it is there? No, 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 no. It, it, it has backed out. Share the screen again. Yes. Yes. No. Now on the top, there is a red border. In the red border, initially it is file, then home, 
then insert, then design, then transition, then animation. Yeah, After yeah. that slide show, yes, press it. Yeah. And then on the left side from beginning. Yeah. And now you will be there, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Josh, thank you, sir. Oh, no. And my talk preface is very basics. I'm going to talk about mainly on very basics. What is cytokine, types of cytokines, and what's the pathology there, so that we can know how, what is the role of cytokines in that. So then we have the cytokine inhibitors on top of that, and finally the role of surgery. Start with cytokines or small secreted proteins, as I all know. It is synthesized and released by the WBCs and tissue macrophages. It mainly mediates and regulates the immunity, inflammation, and hematopoiesis also. It involves an intracellular signaling during immune response. I either it stimulates or suppresses the functional activity of the blood scavengers or the fibroblast or endothelial cells. <clears throat> there are 200 cytokines have been diagnosed so far and it produced from immune and inflammatory responses, and it is closely and transiently regulated and acts by binding specific receptors on the target cells, and its actions can be either endocrine or autocrine or uh, paracrine. And there are cytokines, there are six or seven cytokines are available, but the rheumatology, we are mainly, even though Agathi has got some roles on that, but mainly interleukins and tumor necrosis factor, and particularly alpha DNA alpha is more concerned with the rheumatology. And because my next speaker is going to talk on interleukins, I will not really touch upon those things. <clears throat> but these two, two things are very important, very cytokines are very important for the concern with the rheumatology. And coming to the interleukins, it is mainly T cells and mononuclear phagocytes and in signal communication, and also in the cellular division and differentiation. That is 35 well-known interleukins have been identified and many more are played. And they act on the receptors. There are four types of receptors are available and mainly concerned with the type one receptor is more, than, more involved in the rheumatology than other things. On binding the cytokines to the receptors, there is a cascade of even suckers either which inject or inhibit the transcriptional genes and act through the ligands so that the structural damage is done. And mainly TNF-alpha and IL-1 and 6 is involved. The other two, my subsequent speaker will talk on this. And the is basically, as you're all aware, is a chronic system inflammatory disorders, mainly by autoimmune reaction, and T-cell is a pivotal role in destruction. Both as and when the action is initiated, the T cell and D CD4 plus appear in the joint and it activates the synovial capillary endothelial cells and migration of other endothelial cells follow. <clears throat> and arthritis has got the four stages. One is induction, another one is inflammation, another one is self perpetuation another one is a destruction. On induction, early phase, it, it starts, it initiates the autoimmune reaction, mainly it, it, it activates the APC through the TNF alpha 6 and 23. And the second stage, these things, these APC activate the T cells. And the third stage is the cell perpetuation, that is the, the macrophages and T cells acted through the TNF alpha 6 and 7. And finally, is the destruction stage. So the drug action can mainly take place either in the early phase of induction or in the third phase of self perpetuation this cytokines work. So another something that happens in the lymph node that happens in the circulation, this happens in the lymph node, as and when the initiation takes place, once again, the synovial cells are activated and then subsequently the structural damage happens. And mainly, as I told you earlier, because of the infiltrated T cells and macrophages secretes alpha and other interleukins so that it acts on the cartilage, it acts on the, <clears throat> the cartilage, it acts on the osteoclast, and then inside it produces the fibroblast and ultimately vanus formation occurs. So all these three things basically the structural damage is the cartilage destruction, osteoporosis, and vanus formation. And DNF induced cartilage and bone resorption by releasing collagenase on synovial cells. 
and the expression additions of the molecules, which inhibits the protein glycol synthesis, so ultimately it leads on to osteoporosis. The brain derived growth factors simulate the fibroblasts, which should complete the show, and then the whole thing is fibrose, and then he ends with fibrose ankylosis and through the thalamus <coughs> formation. So, this is at the final stage, all these three cytokines, and particularly TN, TN alpha, and other two interleukins, which my subsequent speaker will talk on, have a great role in policing the destruction. Coming to the cytokine inhibitors, it's mainly TN. F alpha, IL 22, 23, all are pro inflammatory cytokines. They block the oxygen either by receptor blockade or neutralizing the activity of the cells. And so these activate the B cells, produce autoimmune auto antibodies, and at the same time, the activation of macrophages it produces inflammatory cytokines. So this in cytokine inhibitors are both in the earlier stage as well as in the third stage, so that when the microphages induce all the three cells, which is depicted in the picture, a cartilage cell, a fibroblast, and then the osteoblast. These are all the basic steps which happens, and this acts on the earlier phase and middle phase, which give an idea the cytokine DNA of alpha can be used even in early stage itself. At the same time, it not work well in all cases because there are other cytokines like inter interleukin and all is involved. So by giving a TNL alpha alone may not be sufficient to work out in all the cases. So it has to be substituted with other cases as and when it is necessary. Now the cytokine inhibitors, there are two. One is on available, that is mainly on the stage one of this group of drugs. All other things are on the pipeline. It acts on the earlier stage. And the next group of cytokine inhibitors act at the third stage of uh, disease. All others, drugs which is shown in the uh, slides are all under the pipeline, has to be established on its own. Now, who can get these cytokine inhibitors? Not responding to DMRDs or early or even in middle stage of the disease. That's why I insisted on the pathology of the rheumatoid arthritis. If, if, if you understand that, we can agree that early and middle stage of the disease needs cytokine inhibitors. And the caution is, as usual in any other site of biologics we give, all these try to avoid infections, diabetes, tuberculosis, and all the same protocol continues with the cytokine inhibitors also. And now, in the future, what is on cytokine therapy in future? The oral delivery of the genetically induced bacteria called actobiotics, produced by lactobacillus bacillus. And the classical example is uh, recombinant human IL-10 for interstitial bowel disease. For example, it's can move. Probably in the leukosa type in future, other TNF alpha can come like this sometime like in the future. That is what there is the pipeline. Now, the cytokine inhibitors will not work when there is an obviously a deformity or sagittal. Once the structural damage develops, Probably we have to go treatment for the structural damage and cytokine inhibitors mainly to arrest the progress of the disease. It cannot do what the already damage has been done. For example, deformity or sagittal balance of the spine and fracture. Surgical treatment is the choice in these situations. And deformity correction is very, very important because it, it, it hampers your day to day activities because the head is totally flux, the vision may be a problem. And when there is a <coughs> fracture, it can be a card compression, can produce a pain in neurology. And it is technically difficult, of course, to do a surgery on a fully grass deformed spine with a high risk. Of course, with the neuro monitoring and all other advanced gadgets, we carry on with this like this. Next is fracture can occur due to trivial injury because of the osteoporosis is there. Trivial injury can cause a fracture, which is highly unstable situation in a, a arthritic patient. And it is something like a chocolate fracture where it can easily go for uh, instability. A pleural hematoma itself without a fracture can cause a neurological deficit. And <clears throat> the surgery is the choice. Of course, we have to take a person. Surgery is a long concert. That is a state risk. So take home message is disease progression can be reduced even in early stage and middle stage. And cytokine inhibitors are the best alternative when DMRD do not work. It is a targeted therapy and highly selective action. 
may have to be continued with the other cytokines, something like uh, interleukin, which is concerned. And a deformity correction needs surgery with the risk and precautions. Fractures with the neurology to be treated surgically. And the epidural hematoma, most of the time, it is missed because obviously there is no fracture. But in these cases, trivial injury can produce epidural hematoma, can produce a fracture. And uh, if there is a neurological deficit in these types of individuals, better do an MRI confirm and proceed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Razamani. Yes, sir. Right. So you have very nicely discussed about what cytokines are and what the various cytokine inhibitors can do. Now, it is the turn of further explaining regarding TNF-alpha and Dr. S.S. Amarnath. Now, it will be your turn to dilate the TNF-alpha inhibitors role. Dr. Amarnath, please, I stop share. Thank you, Dr. Jha. Uh, welcome. Right. Welcome, Amarnath. <clears throat> Dilip, uh, thank you. Good thank evening. you. And uh, happy new year to each one of uh, our yeah. delegates and faculties. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm going to share the screen yeah. now, and uh, hopefully that should be there. And I will take that. Hope all of you are able to see my screen now. Yes, very clearly. And I'm putting on the PowerPoint presentation. And, and same to you. Uh, yeah. Bhai, uh, can you uh, probably mute yourself? Yes, he will do. Yeah. He will mute. Right. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a very, very interesting. Uh, and to bring out the orthopedician in every orthopedic surgeon, this entire focus is on that now. Today, all the speakers have given us a step ahead and clarity of treatment if one is scared to talk about it or even to try and all even to treat the patients. Definitely, it makes a big difference when once you have the information in hand, you become a better doctor and the patients are at ease when once their pain is relieved. So with that in mind, a small introduction on that. And Rajamani, Dhanashekaran, and Ranjit Jasar, all of you have given a very good clarity on each step of that. Six to eight minutes is a very short period. I'll give you a very short, clear-cut image and very easy to understand and very simple terms. I hope I don't want to confuse you, but definitely we'll be at large available and discuss further. Alpha TNF, TNF, what is that? Tumor necrosing factor. You have become mute. Amarnath, your voice is not audible. Amarnath, your voice. Amarnath, your voice is not audible. We are talking about uh, right. basic. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There's an incoming now. call. There's, sorry about that. There's an incoming call. So now, basically, what we need to do here is we need to understand on the arthritis part and polyarthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and AS, the anchispine, gives us a very big challenge to treat. Now, with that in mind, we need to talk about the little function of these things. It stimulates the endothelial cells and to express the addition of the molecules and white cell has an inflamed synovium on the skin. So this is where the whole challenge comes in, in the induction of the cytokine response with be it IL-6, IL-1, or things like that in a very simple, small example. Now, this is where the, when the synovium is affected, because see, rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic condition. It's not just a joint problem. Joint is a presentation of the challenge that we have in the systemic uh, response that is coming in the immune 
uh, function of the body. So that's where we need to look at that. And then we need to look at how best we can control those uh, cartilage destruction and fibroblast, uh, fibroblast proliferation to be taken care of. Now, in a joint pathogenesis of a destruction, what happens? Inflammation is there, cell infiltration happens, then articular damage. We, being orthopedic surgeons, are the only doctors in the world who have the ability not only to treat, we also feel the joint, see the joint, and we have the ability to replace a joint. But thankfully today, there are other things where we don't need to, you know, uh, probably uh, do a replacement in a big way. So, so that we need to look at that in taking care. Now, in the pathogenesis of RA, all of us know the synovial membrane is very badly damaged. So we need to look at that, how we can. Now, alpha TNF and IL-1 is the biggest, biggest challenge that we need to treat and talk about. Here, this was the first you know, drug which was available, which has been made available for us just over two decades ago, in fact. India, it's about 15 years plus. We have it. And Eternacept was the first molecule where it was augmented to treat rheumatoid arthritis in a big way. And this has been accepted globally. Thankfully, now, not only biologics, we have biosimilars as well. Apart from that, there are quite a few which are made available, alpha TNF inhibitors. In India, by and large, we are using three in a majorly fashion. I'll check on those things, infliximab, etanacept, and adalimumab. These are very well accepted in India and available both in biologic forms and biosimilars, which is a boon for our patients in terms of affordability and obviously the action need to be kept in mind. Let us talk about the mechanism of action of these three drugs. And here, etanacept works a little differently. Now, what happens? When there is uh, activation of the cell happening, so this is where the whole challenge comes into, the signal takes care. Imagine if there are multiple signals coming in, and when once you and I add those uh, monoclonal antibody, there starts to have a different action. But here, we need to understand and make sure that we need to block that much bigger. So alpha TNF receptors will block that uh, signaling pathway and then avoid stimulating huge amount of uh, pro-inflammatory you know, reaction in the body so that it reduces the pain, reduces the inflammation. As Professor Jaya was talking in his first slides, his, he also very, very clearly said, these are targeted therapy. So it works in the cell, within the cell, in the DNA, and then takes the whole thing in a big, big way. So taking the alpha TNF, etanacept, infliximab, and adenomab, they all are just over two decades now. And it's very well accepted. And we don't need to majorly worry about a big way to monitor a lot of things. Yes, the dosage and other things will come there. Here, as the previous speaker was talking about, we can definitely add, uh, you know, methotrexate, Dr. Chinmay Das was talking about it with etanacept and infliximab. In adalimumab, we got a little cautious, but let us not worry. It's been very nicely explained earlier. The first biologic, what happens and where do we go? Here, little on the structure, and I don't want to confuse you. There are a lot of other things that can be talked about. I will just rush through that. And here, it inhibits the alpha TNF tumor necrosing factors, both alpha as beta. But here, alpha is the most important factor coming in. Now, the indications for us are rheumatology and non-rheumatological therapy as well. The dermatologists are using in a massive way for the plaque psoriasis. You and I to get to treat psoriatic arthritis. But here, we need to understand it's also made available to be treated for both seropositive as well as seronegative arthropathy, which is very, very important for us. 
in our treatment and diagnosing it early so that we can avoid the kind of complications further. And definitely the replacement can be avoided in a massive way. Now, the dosage is very simple. Biweekly, 25 mg can be given twice a week as a subcutaneous dose. Two, 50 milligrams is pretty good once a week and then they have a very good response. Addition of methotrexate has been definitely be an adjunctive in a combination therapy. I do have a few of my patients with methotrexate, but many of them are on it, it's an accept. So 50 milligrams as a subcutaneous dose once a week can be given. And the advantage, when there is a remission, we could tritrate and we could probably stop as well. And Dan Shikran very nicely explained about uh, the probiotic. I have a lot of my patients on probiotics, so they do have a better response in terms of remissions for us. You know? So here, similarly, uh, I wouldn't want to take uh, too much of that. It's very clear, 25 or 50, very, very easy. Now, coming to adalimumab, the next alpha TNF blocker, this is also similarly available, but main indications have been like an in infliximab or even here, Crohn's disease has been a major, major advantageous thing. So many of the patients do come across with the you know bowel pathology with arthritic uh, response. So naturally we need to reserve those things for them in a big way. And many times, we need to definitely ask about the bowel habits when we're talking about arthritic patients. That's a different subject altogether. Here, the dosage is a little variant compared to your itanacept. What we do here is we need to give them a loading dose sometimes of 80 milligrams or if not, at least 40 milligrams on a weekly basis. We need to start that because loading dose is important to reduce that acute high inflammatory response and then maintenance can be done. So this is one thing which we need to be taken, both in rheumatoid as well as in the psoriatic conditions, as well as, you know, uh, seronegative arthropathy. Now, coming to inflexi, again, mainly given in by the, uh, you know, uh, gastroenterologists. Now it's been taken over by dermatologists, rheumatologists, and obviously now with, uh, uh, you know, rheumatology interest with orthopedic surgeons. Now, this can be used both in adults and pediatric doses as well. The other speakers will come on. So this is very, very important for us in terms of usage and the indications. Here, the dosage is little variant compared to the intercept or your adalimumab. Here, if we talk about three milligram per kg body weight, and we give it as zero, that is a today, and then second week and six weeks. And then we repeat that once in a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, so that the remissions can be you know, taken very simple. This is in rheumatoid arthritis. Compared to rheumatoid arthritis, when you're talking about ankylosing spondylitis, the dosage is a little variant. We give it a little higher dosage, five milligrams per kg body weight, but the pattern remains almost similar. You know, Six to eight weeks, we probably you know, repeat that and then people have come out with a very good response. The treatment for ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis or even plaque psoriasis is similar, not much of a difference there. As there is a huge amount of efficiency and the patient studies that we need to be understanding, is there, what should I do? Which one do I give? A lot of questions that you need to understand. Third, financial. Fourth, is there any reimbursement facility like an insurance and things like that? Thankfully, with IRDA, I've worked with 15 years now with the insurance segment, and all these drugs, both biosimilar and biologicals, are made available by the insurance segment. Unfortunately, it is still not available for us in a big way for the Aishman Bharat, for almost 40 to 45 crores of patients, but we are working on it and making sure that this can be made available even at that level, because that is a large segment which is neglected. So now, safety first because all these uh, immunosuppressants come with a high uh, prevalent uh, you know, uh, suspicion, I mean, uh, uh, of uh, infection coming into picture. So we need to protect our patients. Basically, tuberculosis is one of the most fearful things. So before we give this treatment, we also treat uh, the infection, if at all, if they have, or we also make sure that 
we don't have the active disease and then we start this. So that's very important for us. And when while on the treatment, mycobacteria has a very big upper hand. So we need to make sure that we take care of that. You know, that is the biggest, biggest thing. There are a lot of studies. I'm going to just run the slides through and then you and I can go through that in a big way. Now, infliximab, adenumab, atenacept. So now where and how? These uh, study which is done just in two years ago in rheumatology from Oxford in UK, it was printed. And here we talk about how well the response have been given. Similarly, here, Internacept has an upper hand there, comparison between other things, similar, not major difference, but definitely Internacept has given a better understanding. Here, definitely the 178 patients were taken in uh, the study, which was printed again uh, just over two years, under, under two years ago, and eight years follow-up has been done. And the kind of complications and the kind of withdrawal when once the patient was uh, taken out, how did the response, and there are, you know, it's very, very clear for us here in all the charts. So this is very, very important for us. And the dosage variation with Internacept has been very well accepted. And while coming into different studies, I'll not waste your time there. I will take the next slide. Similarly, that has been taken care and given to us in a majorly fashion. The advantage of Etanacept is subcutaneous, unlike the infliximab, which is going to be IV and things like that. So naturally, this will be a better choice in terms of, and patient can be advised to take it at home because it comes in a device. And with this, I appreciate your time and thank you for that. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Jha. Thank you. Thank you very much for talking in detail about all of them. And in the end, you have rightly concluded that Etanercept has so many advantages. But it is not always that one biologic is equally effective in all the patients. In your clinical practice, you will find that there are cases which have not responded so well to etanercept, have done dramatically well if you have given them adalimumab. And sometimes infliximab also gives very good results, but for the cost. Well, talking about dose of infliximab, I must highlight here the Western advocated dose is 5 milligram per kg of body weight, but Lieutenant Colonel Chaturvedi has extensive work done, and he says for our Indian patients, only 3 milligram per kg body weight, which is advocated for rheumatoid arthritis in Western world also, is good for spondyloarthropathy. Now, when we have started talking about the dose of a drug, I must tell you, I have given it used etanercept in more than 3,000 cases. And I have used them in only half dose, that is 25 milligram weekly itself. And they have all shown good improvement. It is very rarely that I have to use 50 milligram dose. There is a publication in Japanese journal which says that uh, Asian subcontinent, the body weight is not as high as in the Western world. So the dose can be little lower for all the drugs. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amarnath. Now is the turn of Dr. Ravi Gupta from Chandigarh, who has IL-1 and IL-6 inhibitors to be discussed. Dr. Gupta, please. I will stop, sir. Right. Dr. Gupta. Yeah. So good evening once again. 
and thanks to Dr. Jha for making me a part of this team. And I'll be talking about IL-1 and IL-6 inhibitors. And I'll just keep a broad overview of the drugs. Uh, your voice is crackling. So you can uh, shut off your video and then see what happens. Or, is it okay uh, now? Uh, uh, it, it, it sounds as if it is coming from a distance. Okay. Are, are, are you using an earphone? No, 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 I'm not. No. Okay, so be close to the laptop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, we all know that rheumatoid arthritis is a multi-system disease that affects joints and various other organs. So actually it leads to compromise in the quality of life. And also there is an increase in the mortality. The average life expectancy of rheumatoid arthritis patients is decreased by three to 18 years. That is what our literature says. Now what happens in rheumatoid arthritis so that there are various cytokines, TNF-alpha, IL-1, IL-6. They all work in various manners, maybe autocrine, paracrine, endocrine. And then they act on the synovial membrane, make the tannins, act on the osteoclasts, leading to the resorption of the bones, synovitis. Ultimately, there is destruction of the joint. So if we look at the IL-1, the level of disease activity in rheumatoid arthritis, it directly correlates with the plasma and synovial fluid levels of IL-1. So this is a very, very important cytokine because there is a cascade of effects which it causes by these various mechanisms, monocyte activation, macrophage activation, fibroblast proliferation and the chondrocyte activation and the osteoclast activation and then the corresponding effects which are destructive in nature on the joints, the cartilage as well as on the bone. Now if we look at the, the anti-IL-1 drug, this is the Anakinra is the drug, the trade name is the Kynred and this is the recombinant human IL-1 uh, uh, receptor antagonist. And this is the study which is published uh, in 1998 on 472 patients. And they have got randomized controlled trial, four groups, one with placebo, and then the increasing dose of this drug. And then it was seen that in comparison to placebo, there was a 43% this, this American College of Rheumatology ACR 20 response rate was observed at week 24 in the highest dose group, which is you know, in comparison to placebo, was statistically significant. So that means this was a, a effective drug. So there are various other drugs which we people have seen the uh, FPKC in rheumatoid arthritis, but the main impact of the drug, which is mainly used in rheumatoid arthritis, is anakinra. And this is the various other things the dose is there, the half life is there, the given in a subcutaneous manner. And then these are the off label uses also. So I won't go into the details of those things. Now we must know that in contrast to inhibitors of TNF, the improvements with anakinra were relatively modest. Perhaps it is due to its short half-life and further the inhibition of a single cytokine in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, it appears illogical. As we know that there are a number of other cytokines, especially IL-6, which have not many other effects. But then people saw in various studies that if they combine the IL-1 RA inhibitor with the TNF-alpha inhibitor, 
then the efficacy was much better. So as a combination therapy, it has a better thing. So these are the various, you know, other diseases where this anakinra has been used, but we are only interested in this symposium on rheumatoid arthritis, so I will not go into those details. Now we talk about the IL-6 inhibitors, and if we look at the IL-6, it is a very, very important cytokine for the body because in various infections and tissue injuries, it is so beneficial to enhance the host defense for the patient. But if its uh, secretion is dysregulated and it is persistent, and dysregulated expression, it can be involved in the pathogenesis of various inflammatory and autoimmune diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis. So if we look at this picture, so there are two basic phases, that is the first phase, priming and the effective phase. The IL-6 actually, it acts in both the phases. So it promotes the T helper 17 cells and also various autoantibodies, and then ultimately it leads to destruction of the joint. Another very important effect of IL-6, because we know rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic disease, so it is basically IL-6, which is so important to have effect on multiple organs, which may be liver, it may be cardiovascular risk. I told that the mortality is high, it is mainly because of the cardiovascular risk. Then there is a glucose, dysmetabolism, anemia, fatigue, and mood changes. They are all have been attributed to the IL-6. Now, we talk about the uh, IL-6 inhibitor. The commonest, there are two drugs, tocilizumab and sarilumab. And actually, these drugs, are recommended to be used only if there is a poor response to conventional synthetic or uh, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, or there is a TNF-alpha inhibitor, they have stopped working. They can be used as a combination therapy, or they can be used as a monotherapy. Now, we know that there are a lot of comorbidities, as we saw in the previous diagnosis, uh, this diagram of the pathogenesis of IL-6, it can be anemia, it can be high baseline IL-6 levels, intolerance to methotrexate, but there should not be enhanced risk of tuberculosis. So in those cases, we can use this IL-6 inhibitors. So these are the various other uses of IL-6 inhibitors, but now recently we have seen that in COVID, it has also shown its great role. Now, if we compare these two drugs, IL-1 and IL-6 inhibitors, the main difference is the anakandra is has a modest effect, mainly because of its half-life, but it's quite safe. And IL-6 inhibitors are more effective for pain, stiffness, and other symptoms like mood, anemia, and even some protection against diabetes and cardiovascular. The risks for both these drugs are almost similar, including the increase in the infection. So we should be cautious when we are using them, in especially in those patients who are more prone for infection. So in conclusion, IL-1 and IL-6 inhibitors are the drug choices for moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis, where the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs have stopped working. IL-1 specifically inhibitors like anakinra has a short half-life, but has a potentiating effect when it is used as a combination therapy. IL-6 inhibitors are more useful in severe rheumatoid arthritis with comorbidities as a monotherapy or as a combination therapy. Of course, we must monitor for the side effects of these drugs because they are potentially toxic drugs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ravi.
you have very clearly delineated the limitations and the utility of these two drugs. And tocilizumab came into prominence during COVID days when even a general medical practitioner came to know that this is one drug which can help in situations where the COVID is not under getting under control. Here in rheumatology, both of them, you have rightly propounded, should not preferably be used as monotherapy. Rather, they should be used as co-therapy. Now, next one is mine, where I intend to talk about use of biologics as per the guidelines that we have proposed for IORA and IOA for management of rheumatoid arthritis and spondyloarthritis. Well, Manish Khanna was to talk on early rheumatoid arthritis. So the early rheumatoid arthritis patients, let's once again, after all these discussions, consider what we have in our kitty. We are orthopedic surgeons and we are very sure that preoperatively we have given instructions what instruments should be available on the tray. So here itself, we have NSAIDs, anti-rheumatoid drugs, the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, the conventional synthetic ones, which are methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, and lefnumide. The adjuvant drug is a glucocorticoid, preferably a prednisolone, and the non-biological conventional synthetic drugs. Uh, apart from that, we have targeted synthetic DMARDs and biological agents, which are basically mainly TNF inhibitor first, and then there could be non-TNF inhibitors as well. Well, so the conventional synthetic therapy, the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, they can be used as either monotherapy or dual therapy or triple therapy. Now, there could be a patient who are DMARD nave patients. So what should be our guideline? Low disease activity, hydroxychloroquine, first choice, sulfasalazine should be preferred over methotrexate and methotrexate should be preferred over leflunomide. Mind you, this is a state of low disease activity. When the disease activity is moderate or high, then DMARD monotherapy can be done. Prefer methotrexate here first over hydroxychloroquine and sulfasalazine. Biological DMARD and targeted synthetic DMARD next or methotrexate plus non-TNF inhibitor biological DMARD should be preferred or alternatively targeted synthetic DMARD. So this is the whole crux of therapy in cases of moderate and high disease activity. Monotherapy or combination therapy ultimately leading finally to use of targeted synthetic. Now, there are patients who are not responding and still the disease is moderate or severe. So then go for conventional combination, conventional synthetic DMARD. Go for not mono, but dual therapy or triple therapy. Targeted synthetic, if you have to use, either use monotherapy, but preferably always with, uh, with methotrexate. Lefnunomide can also be added. Alternatively, TNF alpha inhibitor with or without methotrexate, and alternatively, non TNF inhibitor with or without methotrexate. Now, the methotrexate nave patient, but conventional synth synthetic DMRD treated. So, all the other conventional synthetic DMRD have been used but methotrexate has not been used. 
So moderate to high disease activity prefer methotrexate over combination with biologic, uh, uh, over combination with biologic DMARDs or TS DMARDs. So what are the rules for use of glucocorticoid? This will be an additional drug. So if the patient has been on initial CSDMARD therapy, prefer not to use glucocorticoid, but can be used on initiating or changing the CSDMARD. Initial short term, less than three months glucocorticoid for RA disease flares and consider using short term glucocorticoid. Long term glucocorticoid, if for more than three months, moderate or high RA disease activity, DMARD failure cases or biologic failure cases. So these are delineated areas where glucocorticoids must be used. Now, the addendum to the treatment is that to provide best benefit risk ratio for the patient, use glucocorticoids, but lowest possible dose for shortest possible duration. Risk of long-term glucocorticoid therapy must be evaluated. Use acceptable glucocorticoid dose. Risk of harm generally low at long-term dose of less than 5 mg prednisolone. Taper glucocorticoid as rapidly as clinically feasible. Now, go low, go slow must be used in cases of early use of DMARDs. So from pyramidal approach of DMARD monotherapy to step up combination therapy, treatment targeted tight strategy or early step down with combination therapy, which goes by the name of inverse pyramid approach. So talking about spondyloarthropathy, we have formed guidelines. We will not go into this. What is the first line of therapy in spondyloarthropathy? Continuous two NSAID for four weeks. Each one week plus the other one three weeks or two weeks, two weeks each. So two NSAIDs for minimum four weeks. No preferred NSAIDs are there. No systemic glucocorticoids should be used and peripheral arthritis use sulfasalazin or methotrexate. First line therapy, local glucocorticoid infiltration. If two or less than two peripheral joints are involved or isolated sacroiliitis also, you can give local glucocorticoid infiltration. Avoid enthesitis areas like patellar, Achilles and quadriceps tendon. Well, physiotherapy and active exercises, they form basic treatment in spondyloarthropathy. This was first line. Now the second line, first choice is TNF-alpha inhibitors. No preferred TNF-alpha, which whatever you like. Second choice is secukinumab or ixezumab. Third choice is tofacitinib. And for ankylosing spondylitis with uh, interstitial bowel disease or uveitis prefer monoclonal antibodies. So, adalimumab, infliximumab, golimumab, etc. are choices. Here, etanercept is not the choice. So, uveitis, etanercept is not the choice. The management is stop, look, and go. So, reassess the patient. And now I will shift to, well, this I always like to say that uh, traditional DMRDs, can they be used in ankylosing spondylitis or spondyloarthropathy? There are recommendations using traditional DMRDs de novo in higher doses or following biological therapy whenever cost is a constant. And I say sulfacelagin, even otherwise has potent anti-inflammatory effect similar to and uh, also antibacterial and immunomodulator. 
in psoriatic arthritis higher doses of methotrexate are more effective and results are compared to rheumatoid arthritis and remission is achievable in 20%. Now, after this talk, I would like to request Dr. Madan Jairaman, who is waiting from the very beginning, for a very important talk that we have been discussing about orthobiologics. So, he will be discussing about immunological crosstalks between mesenchymal stem cells and rheumatology considerations. Dr. Madan, your term, yes, I'm stopping sharing. Right. I'm sharing my screen, sir. Yes, sure. You have to finish within seven, eight minutes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's just a 20 slides. Right. Uh, very good evening. Myself, Dr. Madan Jairaman from Lalitambi Medical College, Chennai. I'll be dealing with immunological crosstalks between mesenchymal stromal cells and rheumatology, especially with rheumatoid arthritis I'm dealing with. So the basis of orthobiologics is nothing but the three things should be working in together. That is matrix materials, which is the ground substance that is called scaffolds. The second one is the growth factors. These growth factors induce the locally available stem cells to direct towards the desired action. And last one is the stem cell. So all three things should be there in particular area uh, to induce the tissue engineering process. That is tissue reparative process. So there are various sources of mesenchymal stromal cells. As an uh, orthopedic surgeon, we are very well, uh, well versed with bone marrow, which contains mesenchymal stromal cells. Now, recent ideology is on adipose tissue and synovium. As well, other things are all there, embryonic tissue, placenta, endometrium, and peripheral blood. Embryonic tissue, it is not being used for routine therapeutic purpose. It is only for research, and it has a... Uh, it has a uh, disadvantage of cloning. So it has been banned for therapeutic purposes. Umbilical cord and placenta amniotic fluid, all these contains, I, including water jelly, will contain totipotent stem cells, uh, as well as endometrium contains pluripotent stem cells. What is peripheral blood? Peripheral blood contains stem cells. How we have to mobilize the progenitor from the bone marrow. So by giving... Uh, Granulocyte, monocyte, colony stimulating factor. If we give GS, CSF uh, 200 micrograms uh, subcutaneous dose for three days, your progenitors will come to the periphery. From peripheral blood, we can take peripheral blood and go for cellular counting and identification. We can find MSCs. So these are the overall view of sources for MSCs. That is mesenchymal stromal cells. So every mesenchymal stromal cell, whatever we are giving, it should not get rejected. Either it is autologous or allogenic. If allo uh, but MSCs are not getting rejected because there is immunomodulatory capacity of that mesenchymal stromal cells. These mesenchymal stromal cells are nothing but undifferentiated blank cell which doesn't have any CD4 marker or any other markers uh, which give cross reaction to body's own self. That's why we are using immunomoduli uh, I mean immunomodulated MSCs in autoimmune diseases. So the basis of autoimmune diseases is nothing but autoantibodies are killing the body's own cell. So that's why we are getting autoimmune diseases. Here MSC has immunomodulation capacity by two, three mechanisms are acting here. So I'll be explaining the mechanisms. So uh, as a mesenchymal stromal cell, it will secrete nitric oxide. So this nitric oxide will uh, stimulate CD8 cell that is called a killer cell, which will activate, which will uh, in, in routine, it will activate uh, CD8 plus cells. So, but this MSCs will inhibit the action of CD8 plus cells. And the second one is, this MSCs will inhibit the action of B cells. This B cells will secrete plasma cells and uh, interferons. So, it will act two pathways. The third pathway is, it will inhibit CD4 plus also. So that your CD4 activated cells, whichever is present in the blood, it will regulate only T helper 2 cells and T regulator cells because the end product of T helper 2 cells is IL-4. This IL-4 is an anti-inflammatory uh, molecule. 
and TGF uh, are the end product of T regulatory cells are TGF beta, that is increased transforming growth factor beta, which is a chondrocytic in nature, and even it helps in stimulating the other progenitors as well. The second mechanism of immunomodulation of MSEs are through. HLA-G5. This is a soluble antigen, HLA-G5. It will act via this and uh, immunodioxygenase system along with the help of post, uh, prostaglandin E2. So, all these things act in the MSC. So, it will inhibit NK cell, T cell action. So, all the action, even dendritic cell action, every action is suspended. So, your autoantibodies will get destroyed and we can go for regeneration of that particular tissue or anti-inflammatory uh, anti-inflammatory effect of that particular disease. So now come to knee joint proper. If it is a rheumatoid knee, for example, consider this as a rheumatoid knee. So all anti-inflammatory proteins will be there, inflammatory proteins will be there. Both will be mismatching. This equilibrium will be there. So inflammatory proteins will be more outweighing the anti-inflammatory proteins. Along with there will be tissue degradation products that is called damp molecules. All these molecules present in the synovium, synovial fluid and along with the oh, uh, bone lining also. So these things causes uh, when a patient has a rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, so these things will be there more in the uh, joint. So the joint will go for degeneration, secondary OA. So anti-inflammatory proteins are very less. So this is the basic uh, pathology of a arthritis so what msc will do when we when we are putting mscs here for example this place if we are putting mscs into the knee joint what msc will do what all cells will act with msc first one is b cell already i have told b cell proliferation will be uh, inhibited and so your plasma cell won't get converted immunoglobulins interferons nothing will be released so it will inhibit b cell the second one is it activates t two cells and that is T helper two cells and T17 cell that is T uh, regulatory cells. Only these two will get uh, uh, activated. So what all will be inhibited? T cell apoptosis will be inhibited and other these uh, TH17 and T regulatory cells will be activated. So T cell proliferation may happen and it will give anti-inflammatory effect via interleukin 4 and uh, TGF beta. The third one, the main important culprit in all the diseases is macrophage. This macrophage, we have to get converted into, that is called macrophage polarization. So M1 macrophage, which is present in the joint, will be pro-inflammatory. So always the pro-inflammatory has to be converted into anti-inflammatory molecule. That's why macrophage polarization will be happening. These macrophages are uh, obtained from monocyte, monocyte lineage. So this monocyte will get converted into M1 macrophage. This M1 macrophage will increase the pro-inflammatory cascade. So when you put one MSE inside, that MSE will convert monocyte into M2 macrophage, that M2A, 2B, 2C, so many subsections are there. But M2 macrophage is a better macrophage which has anti-inflammatory cascade. Third one is NK cell. So, MSCs inhibit NK cell via that uh, HLA G5, which we saw earlier. So, in turn, it inhibits DC, that is called dendritic cells, which further inhibits T cells. So, all, this mecha all these uh, cells act one in one. Uh, one uh, it will act simultaneously to inhibit the other, so that your anti-inflammation property will be uprised and pro-inflammatory will get down-regulated. So, whenever there is a tissue injury, for example, if you take rheumatoid arthritis, so uh, this, consider this tissue injury as a rheumatoid arthritis. Now, the consensus have come gut microbiome, that is called gut dysbiosis causes rheumatoid arthritis. Um, mainly, to tell porphyromonas gingivalis is the main culprit and privotola is a main, uh, these two are the main culprits which causes rheumatoid arthritis. This has been the consensus being given. So, consider microbial pathogens enters the tissue and it starts autoinflammation. So once if you put MSCs, it will uh, it will be releasing a lot of cytokines and chemokines. This macrophage that is uh, derived from monocytes, this converted into M1 macrophage, which will be pro-inflammatory. So all uh, inflammatory molecules will be increased. That is, phagocytes, uh, our ability of the neutrophils, macrophages will get increased. Cytotoxicity of NK cells, T cells, everything will get increased. Even B cells will increase and immunoglobulins will be produced. Once, if you put MSC in the face of tissue repair, 
during the second week or third week after the uh, inflammation subsides when we put msc into it what happens this msc will get convert uh, convert that monocyte into macrophage 2 so that anti inflammation will happen see finally anti inflammation happens then it will inhibit dendritic cell and uh, it will upregulate t regulatory cell so regulation of t cells will be happening along with the synthesis of tgf beta that is very important molecule in terms of regeneration so what in overall in tissue repair what will happen there is up regulation of anti inflammatory molecules down regulation of pro inflammatory molecules it's a very simple funda so what msc actually does in rheumatoid arthritis <clears throat> that's what we saw in the modulation anti inflammatory less immunogenic pluripotency it is a pluripotent cell and it will enhance in tissue regeneration so everything i have explained here the one only one thing which i haven't explained is secretomes what is this secretome this is very important concept nowadays secretomes and exosomes in the whole body we have from top to bottom like from hair to nail to nail we have exosomes and secretomes but these exosomes and secretomes from mscs that is called uh, mesenchymal stromal cell derived exosome or secretome which will have very good regenerative capacity which will bypass all the pro inflammatory molecules and it will give direct target site of action and it will reduces the inflammation immediately so overall we have seen all these cells nk cell i have so i have told b cell t cell macrophage and dendritic cell what are these three things chondrocyte mast cell and complements so this msc will reduce complement activation so that it will not trigger the further immune re responses this mast cell also it will be degranulator else what will happen if mast cell is getting increase uh, in plasma and blood it, it, there will be increase in ige antibodies which will be a allergic one and what will happens in chondrocyte especially in chondrocyte what will happen so whatever degeneration happens there will be no collagen no water no gags gags are nothing but glucosaminoglycans so when you put one msc into chondrocyte what will happen it will increase the synthesis of collagen first one is collagen the two type 2 collagen very specific type 2 collagen will be increased then agrican protein proteogen everything will be synthesized to form a extracellular matrix that is the second one what all will get down regulated it will suppress apoptosis senescence and it will down regulate the pro inflammatory cytokines that is il1 il6 uh, chemokines 2 and 5 so all these things will get down regulated so these are all the overall immunological cross talks uh, of msc in a uh, response to rheumatology rheumatology itself uh, itself uh, it's a big terminology but every all the cells act in the same way because all are auto and auto immune diseases now come to a comparison just a comparison between oa and ra in oa ni we will get degenerated ni here also the degeneration will be the in ra we will get degeneration along with synovial hypertrophy that is called panas so once we give a uh, msc into the uh, knee joint of oa or ra first let us see oa oa will be joint regeneration will happen immediately there will be no cartilage so aspects of cartilage growth will be seen so how will we inject till inject only intra articularly and what we can expect in oa is immediate pain reduction and slow recovery of damaged cartilage that is a cartilage will get a regenerated now come to ra what is the treatment purpose ra is auto in auto in uh, immune diseases uh, so your inflammation will come down suddenly your inflammation will come down which can be checked by esr crp procalcitonin and other markers ra everything uh, serum uh, ra factor anti ccp everything we can check to control whether the inflammation has been controlled or not how will we give we can give two things one is intra articular and second one is intra venous everyone will tell uh, already peripheral blood stem cells if we take the stem cells are there in the body yes it is there in the body but it is not doing the proper work because it was not in the concentrated way and it is not directed towards the target site once we isolate your uh, stem cells and give it in the pro uh, proper channel it will reach the target site at least uh, if we give 1 uh, million cells at least half of the uh, half of that dose will get uh, reach the target site to initiate the action so here in rheumatoid not alone rheumatoid in all systemic uh, systemic diseases it's better to give iv 
stem cells along with the local stem cells. Local stem cells meaning in the local area. If knee joint is involved, give uh, one dose in the knee joint as well because your uh, hypertrophy, uh, panis hypertrophy, uh, sorry, synovial hypertrophy, panis uh, secretory session, everything will come down along with your inflammation also will come down. But is there any evidence for this? Yes, there are very little evidences for rheumatoid arthritis. There are a lot of consensus for OA, but not for RA. Still, a lot of studies have to come up. Since the patient has been autoimmune, that is what called autoantibodies are there, immunological, mild immunological response will be there in terms of pain, swelling, some pruritus, itching, all those things will be there in RA. So, how to improve the quality of uh, MSEs being given to RA? I mean, rheumatology. Either you have to induce MSEs with hypoxic condition. If you keep under hypoxia, MSEs will have better regenerative quality. These cytokines are nothing but small molecules which Jasser has told. That is cytokines, chemokines, all the small, small molecules which is anti-inflammatory and pro, pro-trophic trophic effect. That is called regenerative effect. And co-culturing. Co-culturing is nothing but inducing the genes. Now everything has come. The 3D culturing, that is uh, 3D printing along with 3D culturing has come. And genetic modification out of phagy. All these things, all these six modalities will increase the regenerative capacity of MSCs when given to RA. So what are the pros and cons between uh, giving uh, intravenous therapy of uh, MSCs to uh, autoimmune patients? It will have better immunomodulation. As, we are, as I have told from starting, it will have better immunomodulation. The second thing, sorry. Second thing will be, it is very, very safe. If you take an autologous blood, it is very safe. It is non-immunogenic, non-tumorigenic, no toxicity. Again, um, people may argue, it is auto, uh, I mean, autoantibodies are found in blood. Yes, it is found in blood, but not, it won't get bound to your MSCs. MSCs doesn't have any cell surface receptors. And it is very safe and effective. Effective in terms of, whenever you are giving any MSC, it will go and uh, give paracrine action. It will go and settle in one place and uh, start spreading your cytokines. That is micro bio micro molecules. That is called small molecules. What are all the disadvantages? First one is source. Which source we have to see? either bone marrow, peripheral blood, uh, uh, umbilical cord. If you are using umbilical cord, amniotic fluid or all allogenic part. You have allogenic already. These people are autoimmune diseased patients. So allogenics, uh, allogenic uh, MSCs may have some more add-on effect. So better to avoid allogenic part. Then autologous. If autologous, what are all the sources? I have listed out so many sources. So from which source you will get a better result? That is a concern. And whenever you are giving an IV, it will go to the pulmonary circulation and will get trapped in the lung and it will be thrown out. So that is the second one. Third one is the, since it is a uh, systemic uh, involvement, we are giving systematically into the intravenous route. We have to find out what is the dose, what is the frequency that is not matching. And moreover, it is a systemic disease, multiple short-term doses we have to give for top-up. And finally... Uh, production cost. If you, if we are going for autologous, there won't be much production cost. But if your autologous cells are not uh, sufficient enough to meet the desired state, then we have to culture expand the cells. And the culture needs a certified GMP lab. So all these things are uh, disadvantages of using MSCs in any diseases, not alone rheumatoid, any disease concern. So my take home message is uh, MSCs, if we use in rheumatology or anywhere, it has immunomodulatory effect, immunoprivileged cells, non-tumorigenic, non-toxic cells, and it will have paracrine effects. Multiple dosing is needed for a short, because it is short acting, multiple dosing may be needed. Autologous culture needs GMP labs and allogenic is still a question. And uh, section 351-361 talks about the regulatory uh, uh, guidelines and frameworks of MSCs to be used in research or therapeutic purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madan. You have rightly said that immunomodulation is the key. And many a times we prefer calling it immunosuppression. But the exact word that we should use is immunomodulation. And you have uh, discussed all the immunomodulator cells in relevance to this uh, parallelism between MSC and uh, between MSC and all the other kind of uh, management uh, which is de desirable in cases of rheumatoid arthritis. So one last question that I can 
pose to you do you think that msc's particularly its use in rheumatoid arthritis uh, is uh, going to be very practical and no sir it won't be practical because it needs multiple dosing patient won't be affordable and it is a long term treatment it's not like oa oa one or two doses will be sufficient to meet the needs to reduce the pain but in case of ra we need to give multiple dosing which adds a big burden to the patient practically right. it is not not possible sir but as well we can go for further research to add scaffold or something so that it will be there in the blood for longer time and it will release elute the msc molecules I mean, right. small molecules from MSC. It was a very good presentation. Well, we have Dr. Madan, one over, question. Over short the time, yes, please. Dr. Madan, are you using these uh, MSCs, uh, or uh, are they being used in uh, OA? Uh, the OA we are using, sir. OA yes. in the form of BMAC, SVF, uh, everything we are okay. using. So, sir. what but what is the uh, where is from where you are harvesting them actually? Bone marrow we are uh, harvesting is, from ASIS or PSIS, sir. Okay, so basically the bone marrow is the source. No sir, other source. for cartilage regeneration, uh, other than bone marrow, adipose gives the better cartilage regenerate than bone marrow, sir. Yes, uh, Dr. Okay. Amarnath also wanted to highlight something. Please highlight. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I think the answer in the question, I think, Madhan, thank you. Uh, basically, today, we have, it's eight weeks now in India. We have uh, the off-the-shelf autologous, uh, you know, bone marrow uh, missing camel cells, which is available now which has been certified, which has been, uh, I have given it to three patients in Bengaluru and all over India, 33 patients, I think, or 33 or 34 patients have received in the last seven weeks. This yes, therapy sir. is available in osteoarthritis. Now, and the figure has, now the figure has crossed 50. Yes. Fantastic. Please. Fantastic. Right. Because I have... To you were the, you I were, actually you were an old man waiting for the insurance approval. Hopefully, you post, were the uh, first yes, single, yes. Uh, I think, Sankranti. Right. Is yeah. it commercially available? Yes, it is commercially, commercially available, available seven weeks ago. by, by seven the weeks name ago. of STEM 1. STEM 1. Yes, sir, yes, sir. The, the cost is 1.25. Yes, uh, but it can be made available to you in 1, one lakh only. Okay, sir. And how many dosages are you uh, prescribing, no, no, sir? Only one. One dose. Only one dose. One single dose. Single dose. Okay, sir. Thank you. Oh, okay. So, uh, Dr. Dilip, uh, you are there. He is traveling in a train and he had said he, uh, he may get disconnected. And I think Dr. Keskar also has not been able to join because he was to travel from his office to his home. And uh, maybe there was a lot of traffic jam. Even otherwise, we have overshot. So we leave aside the discussion part and I'm very sure I will keep half an hour next part of biological discussion for questions alone. Uh, now, I would request Dr. Sarath, who is waiting for vote of thanks. Uh, Sarath, first of all, let me welcome you. This, uh, this is your maiden appearance in this yes, first, sir. Thank you, sir. first webinar. Yeah. And you are a very esteemed member of this subcommittee. Um, I Thank you, sir. Sincerely hope from next time you also start making presentations. Sure, so, sir. Thank please. you, sir, for your nice uh, uh, words. Sir. Uh, uh, good before good before, everyone. before uh, your sir. vote of thanks, Dr. Chinmay, you wanted to say something. No, sir. No, sir. I just want to thank you. Nothing I want to say. Thick. Okay. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, sir. Good evening, sir. everyone. Uh, I am like a sapling in this giant uh, trees of uh, orthopedic rheumatology. I am. Uh, <laughs> I have been given this responsibility. Uh, so I am Dr. Sharat Agrawal, Professor Orthopedics and in charge of Pediatric Orthopedics at Negrims, which is a aims like autonomous tertiary uh, central institute and the government of India is a reference center for the northeastern uh, region of the country. And uh, now a proud member of, <laughs> of course, biological ortho-rheumatology group of IOA and uh, rheumatology 
Subcommittee of Highway uh, 2023. I take this opportunity to thank each and everyone who made this webinar on orthopedic rheumatology possible, thereby achieving the purpose of disseminating knowledge and constantly upgrading through such continuous academic interactions. I would first like to express my gratitude to Dr. Atul Srivastava, Honorable President Iowa, for uh, his valuable time and for his inspiring words, which will motivate each one of us to continue these academic sessions in times to come. To add my association with him is around 35 years old, and I express my heartfelt gratitude to him. I would also like to thank Dr. Ram Chadda, the President-elect of IOA. My sincere thanks goes to Dr. Naveen Thakkar, the Secretary General IOA, whose presence and words have been the source of encouragement for us. Dr. Shantanu Lakhar, President Ayora, is a guiding light to plan such sessions. So we thank you, sir, for your supervision and guidance. We are thankful to our gracious speakers today for their hard work in preparing and presenting this enlightening talk on various aspects of orthobiologics and recent advances in the field of orthopedic rheumatology, which is all new for all of us in orthopedics. My heartfelt thanks goes to Dr. Ranjit Singh from Patna, with whom I got the opportunity to meet at Iocon Jaipur, sir, which was held at two years back. My sincere thanks goes to Dr. P. Dhansekra Raja Coimbatore, Dr. Chinmoy Das Dispur, Dr. A. Rajamani Madurai, Dr. Ravi Gupta Chandigarh, Dr. Madan Jairaman Chennai, Dr. Dilip Mazumdar, and of course, Dr. Sanjay Keshkar and Dr. from Calcutta and Dr. Manish Khanna uh, from Lucknow in absentia. And of course, I would like to especially thank Dr. S.S. Jhasar, who has been the founding father of Ayora and has is spearheaded in coordinating and initiating this unique webinar series. Of course, I remember you, sir, when I was the Secretary of Orthopedic Society, Shillong, and you came to the Shillong, which is the Scotland of East in annual conference of Indian Orthopedic Rheumatology Association as president almost a decade back, sir. Thank you for your invitation, sir, and uh, your nice words for me again. We are obliged to Dr. Ashok Shyam, Dr. Neeraj Bijlani, Dr. Shamsal Huda for giving us this platform for this unique academic extra vengeance. Last but not the least, I express my sincere gratitude to all delegates who attended this session and made our efforts worthwhile. I hope to see you all in our next session. And with this, I wrap up my vote of thanks. Thank you all once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would only like to add Dr. S.S. S. Amarnath only on a day's notice. I talked to him only yesterday and he became oh, ready. Okay, yeah, so sorry, sorry, he sir, for that. A very, very good presentation. <laughs> sorry, my right. my my right. apologies. He was oh, out, yeah. out of list. Gotten <laughs> out of syllabus. So he was out of <laughs> syllabus. Right. But the syllabus could not have completed without you. Amarnath, yes. thank you once again. So thank, thank you, you everybody. Um, uh, all the wives must be angry. We are too late. <laughs> yes. uh, right. So, so kindly say thanks to all the wives also who are waiting in the kitchen. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you to all of them. Thank all do from my side also. Right. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you and thank you, good everybody. night, sir. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night, everybody. Yes. Uh, night. If there is anybody in the studio. So, thank you very much. We can close now. So, what we can do is we will leave. I think okay, no sir. Problem. Thank you. All right. Okay, bye. Uh, Mr. President, any last word? Lakar Chilagaya. Okay. Take Ranjit. Okay, okay, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. 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 Good night.